Um, so what I wanted to talk to you today about is um, model evaluation. So it's uh, one of those aspects of um, how do we <clears throat> take the the sort of technical aspect of running a model and producing data through to the science of solving a problem. Uh, and, and part of that is by evaluating the, the model that we're using. And I'm starting off here with a little XKCD comic um, saying, the one character says, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a stats class. Now I don't know. Now I don't know. Uh, uh, sounds like the class helped well, maybe. Uh, and and this kind of um, reminds me of the the um, the uncertainty I feel that I uh, uh, I'm in whenever I um, delve deeper and deeper into um, the use of statistics for um, model evaluation. Um, but uh, I want to kind of frame the the challenge and the problem. Uh, and so I think that the challenge is that we want to understand how. Uh, and why the atmosphere works the way that it works. So um, why are clouds forming in specific parts of the, the atmosphere? Why is the concentration of ozone changing? Um, what's the role of um, biomass burning on stratospheric ozone, for example? Uh, and the problem is that, that it's, it's a hideously complex um, system. Um, so um, there are so many different interactions, there are feedbacks in the system. This isn't just um, a simple mathematical problem. And so the solutions then is that we can observe um, the, the atmosphere in its natural state. So we can make observations in the field. Um, we can test the behavior of the system under controlled situations. Um, so primarily, you know, one of the best ways that we do that is in the laboratory where we we know exactly what we're doing, what are we altering, and then we can observe, for example, how the concentration of ozone varies by changing concentrations of other species or temperature. Um, and once we have um, enough of a fundamental knowledge of the, the physics and chemistry that occurs in the atmosphere, we can develop a mathematical representation of these processes and we call that a model and so we can model the system mm -hmm. and so it really does begin with um defining the question of interest first uh, and so um although the the model that we are, are using here is is ukca the way in which we use ukca is going to be dependent upon what the question is so we define the question of interest first uh, and, and that's going to be largely the um the um the question that's associated with your research project. Um, and then we think about, do we have a simplified enough mathematical representation of the processes that need to be solved? So um, again, so for example, thinking about the rates of change of chemical species, we want to use differential equations, which can represent how the concentrations evolve with time. Then we need to determine some metrics to, to assess whether or not this um, mathematical representation that we have um, is a sufficient, provides a sufficient solution to the question of interest. Uh, and we want to find observations or some, some true data or, or some sort of data that we can compare the model simulations uh, against um, with these metrics. Uh, and then you can see that we might uh, have a, a loop here where we iteratively uh, improve the model by expanding this simplified mathematical representation. So for example, um, thinking about a continuity equation, we might add more and more terms uh, into that continuity equation. Once we, we feel that we've got a, a model that is uh, uh, well evaluated uh, and validated, then we can go on and use that model to make predictions. Uh, and this is the, the you know, basic flow diagram for, for any kind of model. This this could actually be a, an economical model, right? So uh, we might be interested in predicting um, GDP. Uh, and so, again, we kind of need to think about a simple mathematical representation. Uh, the key thing here is that these are deterministic models. They're, they're not machine learning models. Um, they're not statistical models. These are models that we can... Um, give it, uh, data into them and, and get the same results again and again. 
But how do we know if our model is right for the right reasons? <clears throat> so um, if you Google this question, how do you know if our model is right for the right reasons? Apparently the answer comes back, uh, the Nickelback album, all the right reasons. Um, uh, and uh, if you're as old as me, then you'll remember the band Nickelback, but most likely none of you will remember uh, Nickelback's greatest hits. Um, but uh, uh, that aside, the way that we work out whether our model is right for the right reasons is to evaluate it against other models. Uh, and so that's kind of through what we call these model into comparison projects or MIPS, um, sometimes referred to colloquially as beauty contests. Uh, we might also evaluate our model against reanalyses. Um, and so reanalyses uh, are a very interesting type of data set which uh, convolve both models uh, and observations together. Uh, or we might just evaluate our model against observations of the, the real world. <clears throat> So we may want to evaluate lots of aspects of our model simulation, but, but generally what we'll look at is the model bias and correlation as two key measures of um, uh, success. Um, but increasingly, um, we need to think about looking not only at the model predictions, but also dig into the processes. Uh, and so this is where the, the current sort of drive in model evaluation is around, not just whether or not the predicted quantities are are low of bias, higher correlation, but whether the related processes that control those quantities uh, are, um, uh, are, are robustly um, simulated. So let's define what we mean by model evaluation. Uh, and, and I think what we need to think about model evaluation is that this is a multi-component task. Um, if you think about it just as, a, as, a, as an objective, we want to evaluate our model. To do that, we have a series of subtasks. So the first thing we could think about is model calibration. <clears throat> and what do we mean by model calibration? So this is where we identify how to refine the parameters or the inputs into our model through comparison of model output with observations or other model data. So th this is the kind of possibly the first step um, where we might have some tuning parameters uh, that we know are uncertain. And then we go around and we, we tune those so that we calibrate our model to, 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 to fit some, some observed data or some other model data. Um, so for, for those of you familiar with um, um, some of the processes you know, that, that you're studying, you, you might already have in your mind what some of those tuning parameters might be. Um, as an atmospheric chemist, you know, uh, we, we kind of generally think about um, uh, molecules colliding with other molecules uh, with a specific rate coefficient for those reactions. And if we look at those rate coefficients, we know that actually there's not just one canonical value. You know, based on laboratory data, there's a distribution of potential values for, for that reaction. And so that allows us some, some wiggle room, you know, to decide which value um, to choose. And so that we can often think of as a, as a slight tuning parameter. Um, then after calibration, we, we have the, the, the task of model verification. So this is where we want to quantify the predictive capability of our model. And so again, we, we might go through the same process. We compare model outputs with observations, but this is a different task to calibration as we'll not be using the results here to, to modify the, the, the parameters or the logic in the model. This is where we'll actually just be verifying how good the model is. So we kind of think of this as a, a two-step process. We go through a calibration uh, process of evaluation where we, we find out where the model doesn't do well, we tweak it, and then we go through the verification. Uh, so for simple models uh, and for simple codes, verification may include checking the logic of the model. Um, and so uh, you, you could think about that, that you know, if you write down uh, a simple model uh, on a piece of paper, you know, a series of equations, you could uh, pass that to, to another knowledgeable colleague who might be able to just say, yes, this all makes sense. This, this goes to here, this goes to here. Logically, that's verifiable. Um, however, when we have something as complex as the atmosphere um, and, and a model is as, as complex as UKCA, that verification task becomes increasingly difficult to do um, you know, by just a, a logical uh, uh, induction method. 
it is something that can be automated as well, though. So you can um, find uh, code out there that will, you know, scan your computer code and uh, test the, the sort of logic of it. Um, and during this verification step, given that we've used observations in model calibration to, to find the, the best parameter settings for our model, um, it's really vital that the, the, the data that we're going to compare our predictions with are independent of those data that are used in calibration. Um, and this is where it does become really tricky because um, quite often um, you might find that you're, you're very, for your problem, data limited. And so your problem, you know, let's pick a, a, an example, right? Like um, uh, understanding the climate impacts of uh, large volcanic eruptions, you know, you, that's your problem. Um, N equals maybe like two or three, um, where we have good observations of the, the climate impacts of, of those types of um, perturbations. And so you might do some calibration work, which leaves you, you know, with maybe only one or, or, or two um, cases where you can do the verification. So, so that's really quite tricky then. Um, and uh, thought and care needs to be taken about how you can separate those concerns uh, about model calibration and model verification. Um, I, and, and I think it's really important as well to, to remember from the outset here, uh, although I'm a, a modeler, you know, my, my mantra is that all models are wrong uh, and some models are useful. And, and my job is really to determine like, you know, where our model sits or the model that I'm using sits. Um, I don't think it's worth getting too bogged down by the philosophical argument here, um, but a valid model, you could think, is one in which the scientific or conceptual output is acceptable for its purpose. Um, you know, you can you can get really deep here in thinking about you know how how um, how valid a model is, um, and can you ever validate a, a model of a complex system? But I, I think it's really important to also be practical here. So uh, the, the key criteria here is trying to understand when a model is good enough for its purpose. So um, what other aspects of model evaluation um, might we mean? So um, we might mean sensitivity analyses. Um, so this is where the response of the model uh, is determined uh, relative to changes in its inputs or parameters. Um, and this is really important for understanding uh, the range of suitability of the model. So um, if we think again, that, you know, about that um, uh, case of uh, a large uh, volcanic uh, eruption uh, and the climate response, you know, one um, uh, end member of, of that uh, type of problem might be stratospheric geoengineering. Um, and so uh, it's really important that we uh, are able to quantify how well our models perform under large perturbations so that we know uh, under what range uh, the, the the results are sort of sensible for and suitable for. Um, sensitivity analysis can also help us identify key uncertain parameters or inputs, uh, and it can also help us understand the behavior at critical points and so you, you probably uh, have, have read a lot about um, tipping points in the Earth system, uh, these points where we have bifurcation. So again, we can we can quantify where these sit uh, in input space or parameter space by doing these types of sensitivity analyses. Uh, we'll touch on perturbed parameter ensembles, uh, which are a, kind of a, a type of sensitivity analyses later. And so just as a, a, a summary here then, I, I think when thinking about model evaluation, really we should be thinking about um, this, this basket, this multi-component uh, approach of model calibration, verification, validation, and sensitivity analysis. Uh, and key to all of this is the, the determination of goodness of fit. Uh, and um, and you know one of the key uh, objectives of your scientific work will be determining what the uh, objective measures are of goodness of fit. Um, so how can I tell if my model is good or bad? Um, I, I think first things first, don't forget to focus on what you're comparing. What's your question of interest? Um, 
are you really um uh do you really require um the model to be able to predict hourly variations do you need it to be able to predict bulk integral quantities um um uh, do you need it to just compare well against the mean of other models um in terms of observational data how how good are they what are the biases in those observational data how are they characterized um again we need to kind of um often step back slightly and think about what's the question we're trying to solve what are the appropriate metrics to determine whether or not we're able to solve that question and then where are the the data that we can find to 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 answer that so once we we have all that figured out it's actually quite easy thereafter um there are many different statistical measures that we can use and statistical tests there's lots of different software packages out there that make it easy to compare different data sets uh, and and now we kind of you know are in the realm of data analysis, big data analysis. And this is where, you know, there are tens or even hundreds of thousands of people around the world who, who are doing this on a daily basis. They might be doing it against, you know, shopping trends on, um, you know, the Tesco website or, um, or, or all sorts of other things. But, um, but, but once we've got to this stage, there are plenty of libraries out there and packages that, that make life easy. So how can I tell if my model is good or bad? Um, and I'd say, first off, nothing beats a, a visual uh, inspection of the data. Um, I, I always like showing um, these plots. These come from Anscombe's Quartet. Uh, and so we have um, four different data sets of uh, X and Y. Uh, and as you can see, um, they visually show us some, some strikingly different uh, behavior. However, um, if we think about bulk uh, statistical properties, like the sample mean, the variance, and the uh, correlation coefficient of y uh, to x, all four data sets have numerically the same values. You know, it's kind of like a fourth decimal point that they vary. Um, but by plotting, you know, these scatter plots, you start to see that um, those... Um, statistics that can be derived probably uh, are not representing the full um, nature of the relationship between these different variables. So, <clears throat> you know, and let's just kind of do this visually. I mean, uh, for this uh, Y versus X, actually, you know, what we're plotting is a, 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 a linear um, uh, least squares regression through Y and X, which is this blue line. And you see the same blue line is on all data sets. Uh, and that makes sense with a, a data set like this, that we've got, you know, an equal number of sort of a, a, above the line as, and below the line. Similar here, what we have is a data set of like scatter between Y and X. Uh, here we've got, you know, really good uh, correlation between Y and X and uh, an outlier. Whereas here we've got effectively no correlation between Y and X apart from one point. Again, this is quite likely an outlier. Um, and so you could really think about having seen this, fitting other models to your data, not just uh, linear models to your data, to determine um, whether or not um, uh, there's, a, there's a better uh, way of um, uh, describing the relationship between these two variables. <clears throat> um, I'll go through some, some sort of metrics which are quite commonly used, uh, in particular in, in air quality model performance. Um, and so first off, just to kind of uh, outline the, the names of the different variables. So we've got M being the modeled or predicted concentration, O being the observed concentration. Um, uh, and in this case as well, we we'll use X as a predicted or observed concentration and Sigma being the standard deviation. So we've got the, the mean bias, uh, the mean error or the root mean square error, we can um, define using these different equations. So the root mean square error, where we take model minus observations squared and take the sum of that and divide by the number of observations that we have, and then take the square root of that. That's probably one of the, the most widely used um, error statistics. 
we can um, normalize the mean bias by uh, looking at the uh, absolute bias and the sum of the absolute bias divided by the sum of all of the observations. Uh, and we can um, apply a um, operation here to make sure that we only have um, uh, uh, positive values. So we just take the magnitude of those differences and don't allow the values to get negative. Um, and then we can look at that. Uh, and then we can do things like fractional bias, uh, fractional error, uh, and, and then we can get on to uh, things like the correlation coefficient. Uh, and so in the correlation coefficient, we're um, uh, looking at how uh, the observations uh, vary with the, the mean of the observations over the standard deviation of the observations, uh, and the model points um, uh, vary with the mean of the model points divided by the standard deviation of the model points. Um, and so our, our implicit assumption here is that uh, in, in this model of correlation, uh, that um, the, the data uh, fall with a, a, a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. And, and, and that might not be true. Uh, and so this is one thing, uh, again, that we, we probably want to assess. So we could do that by looking at the uh, PDF of the observational data. What does the distribution look like? Is it, is it well represented by a, a normal distribution? Similarly, the, the model data. And if not, we can find other metrics to, um, to determine uh, correlation. Um, we also have the unitless index of agreement, which can be used to, to tell us about how, um, how well, again, our, our model data compared to observations. Um, the mean absolute error is a straightforward measure of how far away our model simulation is from our observations. Uh, and it takes the modulus of the absolute error. And so it's always positive. Uh, this is kind of one that's kind of quite widely used as is the, the mean squared error. Um, again, it's kind of like that there are a lot of different approaches to statistically quantifying um, the the error between your your model and your um your, your your data that you're using in verification or calibration uh and i think it's it's kind of key to have a look at how um uh a the the underlying data look and so are there assumptions about some of these metrics which mean that, that, that they're not really valid you know the pearson correlation coefficient i showed earlier not really valid for um, data that aren't normally distributed um the mean squared error, is that really any better than a mean absolute error? I think it's kind of down to the user and your interpretations to um, whether or not you feel like it's better. It doesn't seem like there's a strong argument. Um, but what I do want to talk about is um, uh, more recent, um, sort of this is going back actually now almost uh, eight years uh, ago, um, approaches to, to model evaluation. And so this is a, a really nice paper in um, ACP. Um, and uh, I think Luke can make these slides available. So if you want to kind of go into it in detail, I'd really recommend it. Um, what I'm going to do is just go through a few of the, the key uh, results from, from this paper. Uh, and what the authors um, did was they um, sort of uh, started off with the mean square error um, as, a, as a way of thinking about the um, the uh, metric to de determine model um, validity and, and verification. Uh, and, and what they showed was that you can actually decompose this equation. So the mean square error being given by here, the sum uh, of all of the points of the model i minus observations i squared over the number of points. Uh, into a relationship like this, where we have the mean square error is actually equal to the variance of the models minus the observations, plus the bias squared. Uh, and the variance of the models minus obs is equal to the variance of the model, plus the variance of the observations, minus two times the covariance of the model and the observations. And so by expanding this out, they then have an equation, five, which says that the mean square error can actually be decomposed into a, a bias term, uh, a model and observations variance term, 
and a model observation covariance term. Uh, and this covariance term accounts for the degree of correlation between the model and observed time series. So, so this one metric, mean square error, actually can tell us about absolute bias. And so if we're thinking about a, a process like um, concentrations of air pollutants, like one reason that we might have uh, a model that doesn't uh, perform well against observations is that the inputs into the model might be wrong. So if you take, you know, modeling the concentrations of some pollutant, you're dependent on the uh, magnitude of the emissions uh, which uh, are being input into the atmosphere that you're simulating. If your concentrations that you're simulating are too high, that might be just because the, the inputs are, are, are driving that. So that bias has nothing to do with all the equations which you have in your model, which are, are telling you about how the pollutants' lifetimes vary as a function of other species. And so that um, assessment of, you know, th your model being wrong can um, be uh, uh, now decomposed into, well, there's going to be a, an aspect of your model being wrong because of a bias, which can be just potentially quite easily fixed, but also an aspect of your model being wrong because the covariance between your model and observations is wrong. So that last term. And that's much more processes uh, that control that. So that covariance might be driven by meteorology. It might be that the wind uh, that you're simulating is, is not right compared to the, the wind that's uh, uh, observed. So you might use something like meteorological nudging to fix that, rerun your, your um, simulations, rerun your calculations here, look at this. Uh, if you still have that you know, mismatch between the covariance of the model and observations, we can then start to think about, well, uh, what, what other sources uh, uh, of, of error might be driving that? And that might be down to the equations. So um, uh, um, yeah, this is just sort of a further explanation of that. Uh, and this is a, a, a picture now which kind of shows that. So um, what uh, Salazzo and uh, colleagues did was they looked at a, a range of different air quality models. So these are plotted on the bottom here. Uh, and they they have from the models the hourly output across a number of different receptors where there were observations made across the European continent. And um, if you're familiar with um, uh, something like air pollution uh, as a function of time, uh, then you might be familiar with the fact that there'll be short-term fluctuations. There might be a daily cycle in the data, and there might be a seasonal cycle, and there might also be a long-term trend. And so what they they did uh, in their analysis here was they, they, they calculated the mean square error uh, into those different components, the bias, uh, the, the sort of the variance, and the, a, a thing here in green called the minimum mean square error, it's, uh, we can get onto that in a second. But they also um, took that time series of data and decomposed it into uh, using a spectral technique, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, into the, the long-term um, component of the data, the synoptic component of the data, the um, diurnal component of the data, and the uh, uh, interday component of the data so like the daily variability uh, the day-to-day -day variability and um then they they looked at these uh different um uh models they looked at loads of different stations and then just averaged uh the performance uh of the the, the models against all of the stations that they looked at and highlight here where the main sources of error come from and so what you could Um, uh, most of the um, uh, uh, interday diurnal and synoptic um, errors uh, come from this minimum mean square error component. Uh, and this minimum mean square error component is partly attributed to the, um, uh, the variance of the observations themselves. And, and so this kind of tells you that there's too much variability in your observations to be able to, to fully constrain um, the performance of your model, i.e. the 
the noise spectrum of your data it is much more noisy than the, the noise of your model. But when they look at that long-term um, component, so the sort of the, the trend component, they actually see that the bias uh, is really important in a number of models. And so that can kind of point to some sort of uh, general gross um, you know, error terms, potentially in emissions. This is looking at ozone in particular. Um, so I'm going to skip through that. I'll just talk then about spectral decomposition. Uh, so spectral decomposition is, is not new um, and it's widely used in other fields of physical science, but it's been used less in evaluating atmospheric composition. Uh, effectively, if you, you know, do um, um, you know, some sort of maths course in your first few years of, of uni, you'll be looking at um, Fourier transforms of data. That's a type of spectral decomposition. Um, that makes some assumptions about how the, you know, the, the underlying data can be decomposed into sine and cos waves. Um, that approach has been used to say, looking at um, observations of atmospheric composition as far ago as the, the 1970s, um, and then variations on that approach have been developed to deal with things like gappy data or, you know, noisy data, et cetera. Um, here we're looking at um, plots of the, um, I think this is the ENSO uh, frequency in um, observations and uh, uh, models using uh, UKCA. And again, what you're able to sort of see is that there's this nice uh, peak um, in uh, time of this uh, event that the model captures quite well and, and with similar um, uh, power. Um, so that's what the, the y-axis is, is effectively telling you. Um, that uh, decomposition of ozone into the, the long-term ozone, the synoptic, the diurnal, and the intraday uh, is based on something called the kolmogorov sabenko filter. And uh, Nikolai Kolmogorov was a really famous um, physical scientist, I guess, uh, an oceanographer who, who developed lots of statistical techniques for understanding complex data relevant to the atmosphere and to the oceans. And so developed an algorithm which takes your time series and, and outputs these different components. And again, if you're interested in doing that kind of uh, uh, analysis, you don't need to write the, the algorithm yourself. Um, there are Python packages and uh, R packages and, and all sorts of packages, I'm sure, in MATLAB as well that allow you to do that. Um, my colleague, um, Matt um, Evans um, at the University of York, um, you know, did some nice work on this again, like um, uh, a long time ago now, looking at observations of, of ozone um, at different locations. And this is really utilizing high time frequency observations over a long time period. Uh, and then looked at, you know, what's the average, what's the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. This is how you, you can really think of this um, full picture as being composed of these different uh, contributors. Uh, and again, Matt, you know, published some some nice work uh, looking at how you can um, uh, evaluate models based on uh, these approaches of um, sort of spectral decomposition. Um, skip over that. Um, and then. Just to sort of say again that this um, uh, Efficio Salazzo, who, um, who led that nice work in 2016, uh, again sort of did a, a, an, an update in 2017. Uh, and, and in this case, he was kind of taking a, a multivariable uh, temporal and spatial breakdown. So not just looking at one species like ozone, but combining multiple species. And again, I think this is a really powerful way of understanding model performance. Uh, and so in this case, uh, they they broke down regions, so they broke down regions, uh, you know, based on geographic areas, um, and uh, looked at carbon monoxide data in these regions. Um, yeah, in this case, they sort of looked at um, uh, again a whole bunch of models and, and looked at the um, uh, long term seasonal uh, diurnal performance. 
uh, I looked a bit at different time periods as well and to try and identify whether or not there were um, particular time periods where models were performing badly. Uh, and they found that the cause of model bias for carbon monoxide is probably attributable to the emissions and to a lesser extent, the generally overestimated surface wind speed. So, so again, they were able to make some really nice, clear um, uh, conclusions. They then looked at NO2 as well. So that's part of this multi-species approach. And they said that the bias is the main contributor to the NO2 error and stems from a model under prediction of the mean observed concentration during the entire year. Bias is probably caused by a combination of factors, including emission estimates, PBR height, and vertical mixing at night. So did a lot of work, looked at a lot of data, um, drew a conclusion, which unfortunately is kind of like uh, quite open to interpretation. As a, as a non um air quality specialist, I probably could have told you uh, from experience that the bias is probably caused by a combination of factors, including all of the above. Um, so I think what's key then is this approach of, well, how can we go a bit further? So, so one approach, for example, to understand the role of PBL height would be to find uh, a species with observations that um, is only uh, affected by PBL height. So some of you, um, you know, particularly if you're in the UK, living in the Southwest, might be familiar with um, uh, or more familiar with this uh, uh, problem of radon. It's kind of a, a radioactive gas that's uh, produced as a byproduct of the um, nuclear decay of some minerals present in certain types of rocks. Uh, and uh, in the southwest of the UK, uh, those rocks are really prevalent and we have the very high levels of radon. Um, radon is, is monitored because it's radioactive and so you know can contribute to um, your susceptibility to, to cancer. Um, and radon is quite well measured across the world in, in different locations. So radon just have, has an emission and then it undergoes um, you know first order, decay with a constant half-life radioactive decay so the concentration of radon uh, you know is, is going to follow quite uh well the pbl height and the higher the height the more it will diffuse and so again you could think about bringing in something like radon as a gas to to, to say how important pbl height is You'd need emissions, you'd need all the models to, to simulate radon, um, and you'd also need some good observations, but, but that's just as an example. Um, so, so overall, I mean, this these new approaches, have they sort of changed the, the game? Have they changed the picture? Do we now know uh, what the main sources of error are more specifically? Unfortunately, no. Um, I think we're still in a case where we we have better methodologies now to carry out evaluation activity, but we still have not quite nailed down what the main sources of error are. So that's that's kind of good and it's bad, but uh, you know, and the, the good thing is, is there's plenty of room for, for you all to, um, to improve the situation and state of knowledge. I've got a few more slides. Um, and, and again, some of this is just about um, taking a step back from um, the process of model evaluation uh, and thinking about the reality of the, the problem at hand. Um, and and th this is based on a slide that um, a, a colleague of mine, Dick Derwin, um, showed in a, in a talk once. So, so Dick was a, a real pioneer of um, atmospheric chemistry modeling in the UK, um, probably one of the first people to, to, to actually run a, a 3D chemistry uh, model in the UK. And um, Dick, sort of um, rationale for showing this picture is, you know, w one of these is a, a Turner, um, you know, prize winning uh, piece of art uh, by Tracy Emin, I think, you know, after she had a depressive episode, she just, you know, put her bed on display. The other is an interpretation of that. So this interpretation of, of uh, you know, reality, uh, we can see on the left, it's not perfect. Uh, and, and that's what your modeling is. Your, your modeling is is never going to be perfect. It's never going to be reality. Um, and then the question is, is uh, the, the work on the left a suitable enough um, impression of reality that it can convey uh, what you need? Um, 
And so I said I'd talk about perturbed-parameter ensemble, so I'll touch on that, that briefly, uh, uh, conceptually at least. Uh, and, and conceptually here, um, one of the key things uh, that we're trying to do with perturbed-parameter ensembles is um, perform uh, sensitivity analysis uh, over multiple dimensions. Um, so um, we might um, uh, be familiar with changing one parameter, running a model, changing another parameter, running a model, and getting a, a series of uh, outputs where we've changed one thing at a time. Um, the perturbed parameter ensemble approach um, is best done when we take a, a, a stance of perturbing multiple parameters at once. And so one of the key things there is designing uh, the experiments which allow us to perturb multiple parameters at once. The rationale for doing that is that um, because we can have feedbacks between um, param uh, uh, state variables in the system, it might be important that we perturb you know, parameter one and parameter 10 so that we can uh, correctly um, and simulate how the, the state variables that relate to those parameters evolves and, and interact. Um, and, and what we have here is um, aerosol mass uh, after the Pinatubu um, uh, eruption. And we've got some satellite data from HERS and SAGE, two different instruments in, in gray. Uh, and then we've got some uh, um, Reanalysis data, I think, from the Spark reanalysis project, uh, and then we've got a whole bunch of different simulations. Where uh, in in here, what we're doing is perturbing uh, things like the mass of SO two emitted, and you can see there's a significant variability and and uncertainty on what that value is. And so, what we can do then is run a series of simulations perturbing a number of parameters. Uh, and find uh, the optimal uh, comparison uh, to the data. Uh, and this is really stuff that um, Ken Carslaw's group in Leeds have pioneered uh, in the atmospheric uh, science community. And I think we need to you know, give a hat tip to them for, for pushing the frontiers there. Um, at the, the, again, you know, these uh, uh, are things you might want to, to sort of dig down into in, in more detail um, offline, but but again, what we kind of start by doing is choosing model parameters that we want to study. Uh, and, and that's not as easy as it sounds. It, it does require some sort of insight into the, the processes which you're simulating. And so as a PhD student, it can be quite daunting uh, or as a, you know, a not yet quite an, an expert of the processes. And that's where, you know, you can rely on other experts or a process of elicitation from experts to try and identify what those processes might be. Um, so uh, last thing I think is, is just about maybe some of the technicalities here. So a quote from Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, that's, you know, that's a great um, quote about models. And I think something uh, to really, um, Take, take home. But um, clearly Einstein had never interacted with Stash uh, before coming up with this quote, because uh, this kind of goes against some of the principles of Stash. Um, throughout the tutorials, you'll be learning more about interacting with model data. Um, so you'll make use of um, things in the long run, like potentially the, the Met Office archive mass and, and how you can pull out data from there. Potentially, you know, you might be using XConv. XConv, I think, is a really handy tool because it, it reads PP files and has a graphical interface. I, I like it. You can get it for Macs as well uh, as, as Linux distributions. Um, I guess, though, one of the main things I, I always used to do with XCOM was just uh, open things up, have a quick look, and then convert to NetCDF. And then once you've got a NetCDF file, uh, then you can use lots of different things. Um, Panoply, is, again, is a nice um, GUI-driven way of uh, viewing files. NCView is probably the most robust way of um, uh, graphically uh, interacting with NetCDF data and, and, and viewing it. Um, and 
we have an evaluation suite for UKCA, and you can see um, on the um, uh, UKCA website some, some information about how to run that. Um, and I just want to sort of show some of the, the things that uh, we, we do with that. So, so one of the things that the evaluation suite does is it allows us to um, compare against a, a, a bunch of um, uh, multi-component uh, data. So the, the Bodecker data set is a, a combination of um, satellite data and ozone sonde data to tell us about the total column of ozone. Uh, and uh, list data, which is um, plotted in in black, can then be compared against the um, modeled total ozone column in these colors. And you can see where you know the, the model performs well, where there are biases uh, against uh, the the observations. Um, the the evaluation suite also then does some calculations of error correlation against uh, ozone uh, uh, and observed ozone. And you can see that in terms of total column ozone, the model does a good job. Uh, and then we can dig into things like um, the budgets of um, species. So thinking about uh, tropospheric ozone here, we can kind of decompose that using diagnostics in the model into the, the amount of ozone that's produced, the amount of ozone that's lost, the net difference. And then we can compare that with the amount of ozone that's inferred to come from the stratosphere. And we also have a, a, a tracer in the model, which basically allows us to diagnose the, the flux of ozone from the uh, stratosphere into the troposphere and you can see that those numbers agree reasonably well um and then i think i'm going to end there um to be honest um so i wanted to leave a little bit of time if there are any questions um and again just say thank you for your attention this morning thanks alex that's great um clapping on zoom never works that well but uh, <laughs> thanks very much um, are there any questions, uh, for Alex, Leah? Um, hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, so have you tried, uh, using PPs for the same kind of study that you did for spectral decomposition and how do the results compare? Um, I've not seen that. Um, I think that's a really good idea um, to do. I've not seen that happen, and I certainly haven't done that. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, combining multiple, you, you know, if these uh, uh, approaches together is is is, is, is a really, um, you know, novel thing at the moment. Um, so partly, I didn't kind of go on to it, one of the... the benefits of um, those PPEs is that um, they do provide you massive data sets uh, of the, you know, the effect of your modeled output given some combinations of inputs. And so from that, you know, you can develop a secondary task, which is to learn the output from those inputs without the model, so machine learning. So, um, so what Ken, you know, further pioneered in his group was the application of a type of machine learning called Gaussian process emulation. Uh, and one of the, the the nice things about Gaussian process emulation is that um, it it not only um, uh, allows you then to very quickly predict the the state of your system, but it gives you error estimates as well, and it allows you to attribute. Um, from the inputs, uh, you know which inputs are most important for for um, uh, for this concentration. Say, um, I say, what uh, what they did a lot of work on there was things like monthly average, and so combining that synoptic, really that you know sort of time temporal decomposition and Gaussian process emulation or, or even just PPEs would be really nice to, to mm -hmm. kind of dig deeper into the temporal behavior. Thank you. Um, I had another question if that's okay. Yeah, yeah okay. that's so, great. Um, when you do spectral decomposition, is that comparing different models or different 
um, are you comparing like different models? And if so, how do you deal with um, if models come from kind of the same core, like if they're built kind of similarly, that the bias that comes with that? So the spectral decomposition is, you know, it's agnostic to, to what the source of the data is. Um, you could do model model spectral decomposition to to look at um to look at that uh and i think um it would be interesting to see whether you know if you take um cmip6 data so the australian um earth system model axis uh and then uk esm have the same dynamical core you know effectively slightly different versions but the same dynamical core and so it would be interesting then, yeah, to, to compare um, whether or not um, using decomposition, some of uh, those um, spectra show the signal which is related to the dynamical core, uh, and some of those spectra, you know, show signals related to some of the other differences, say, between uh, uh, UKSM and, and AXIS. That'd be quite interesting. I'd, I've not... I've not seen that. I've seen a lot of work on kind of the genealogy of of models, and so by using things like principal component analysis to um, um, evaluate uh, or like to to take your data and and uh, abstract it into its principal components. If you do that, you can then see that all of these models are, are basically variants of the Hadley Center model. All of these models are variants of the um, European Center. Uh, model you know they're all derivatives of ECAM and uh, and all of these other models are variants of the NCAR model so like NOR ESM is CESM, CESM is CESM uh, and then uh, you know there are various other models that under the hood are, are just NCAR models with a different brand um, so yeah I think that that approach would be quite interesting as well to see whether you see similar signals there okay thank you Pleasure. That's great. Thanks. Any other questions? No, I mean, I, I was wondering, Alex, I mean, this might be opening a whole can of worms. What could we do better with UKCA? I mean, obviously, you mentioned the evaluation suite. It's been around for a while. Is there kind of something you think now, thinking about it, actually, we're really missing this. We should put this in. Um. I think um, one thing that um, it strikes me that we haven't quite um, expanded on is um, community data sets for evaluation on Jasmine. Uh, and so like there's a maybe there's like just a um, a wider sort of task here for the community, but um, I think a lot of people in their research will find a data set that's specific to their question that they can use for evaluating the model against that question. And and yeah, maybe that data goes on Jasmine in their, you know, slash home slash GW, you know, whatever directory, but doesn't seem to then get pulled and made more widely available after somebody does their work. And so once you've developed scripts and and uh, tools to evaluate um, the the model's performance, you know, against a, a process or a, a specific variable, it would be great to kind of see that pulled uh, pulled together. And so that would require both the underlying data to be like more visible, but also probably something like a, a repository of evaluation scripts that that people just you know, commit to and um, and uh, and make available. Um, and so it's a bit like Kevin Costner's um, film Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. And, and maybe it just starts with, you know, the first thing, somebody needs to be bold and, you know, make a directory and say, hi, you know, I've made a directory for all observations for UKCA analysis. Here it is. Please populate it. We have one agreement in the chat from uh, Amy saying that yeah. that'd be really useful. Um, Maria Paula, I see you got your hand up. Yes, uh, just some general questions. Um, just to check 
Then this tail, like the MSE and the spectral decomposition, this actually can be used for all the modeling evaluation, model calibration, and model verification. It only the important is what are the data that is compared. Yeah. yeah. OK, that's perfect. And I wanted to ask other thing. Ah, yes, um, these data sets that are used for uh, comparing Jasmine are all based in observations or are some based in models or analysis. Is any like a same origin for all of them or they, are, they have multi origins? Sorry, could you repeat that last bit? Do you, the UK, you yeah. do, do you mean the UK? Do you mean the evaluation suite Alex talked at the end, about at the end? The data set that he just mentioned in Jasmine for community data sets. That oh, so that was a suggestion, I guess. Yeah, that Alex. Yeah, that's more of a suggestion. I mean, we, we do have the evaluation um, uh, suite on. I think it's on Jasmine, and so that actually does have then folders of data which are used. It, for making the um, the plots that like, like I, I showed, um, but they're quite limited, right? That like, you know we don't look at a huge number of um, um, things it, it, with the evaluation suite, and so I think my suggestion would be, you know, that more and more people um, contribute to that. You know, um, not not that anybody needs to kind of take it all on and make it like their their full job but if you know bit by bit everybody can uh, add a bit more to it i think we'll be in a much better situation okay yeah there's also licensing issues as well isn't there with some data absolutely yeah so so it, it and that's what makes it kind of tricky if you it's a if it's one person's job it's actually quite overwhelming to kind of do all that kind of work but if you've had to do that anyway as part of your project you've you've worked out what what data can you can you put on jasmine in the first place you know what data is uh not um prohibited by some sort of license of use uh and etc 